O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to us through your word, and that we would hear it and believe it this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, several years ago, I went through a unique work experience that maybe some of you have shared. This was several years back. Um, Have you ever worked with someone who was mentally unhealthy? Have you ever worked with someone who had some mental health issues and you had to work with them day by day? Uh, If you have been in that experience where you have to work with them day by day, you know it can be incredibly problematic. And that's a nice way of putting it this morning. There's a lot of problems and challenges. And several years ago, I worked with someone who was not healthy mentally. And it was, it was an incredible challenge. It was one of the most challenging, honestly painful experiences of my life. Um, and no, that wasn't Charlie, um, if, you're, if you're thinking. It wasn't Charlie. <laughs> that was the second most painful. No, I was kidding. Uh, no it wasn't Charlie. It was, it was before that. Um, but that experience, which was very difficult for me, caused me to read a little bit more than I had before and learn a little bit more than I had before about mental health problems and issues in America because I never really encountered it in that kind of close proximity where I had to deal with that uh, on a daily basis. And it caused me to read more about it and realize there are so many issues uh, related to that, to mental health in America today. Uh, In America, um, anxiety disorders are the most common problem. Anxiety disorders, the most common mental illness. Uh, I read this past week that it affects as many as 40 million Americans 40 million Americans. Globally, the number I read is 300 million. 300 million people struggle with this and deal with this. So 40 million Americans, so that's, what, one in five, something like that? So very common problem or challenge, and globally 300 million people. And I, as I read, thinking through that this week and read through it, I read this survey that said, here are the top three things that people are anxious about, and see if any of these describe you. And these are very common. Um, the first one that most people are anxious about is health. The second one that people are very anxious about is finances, money. Do we have enough money? Then the third one that most people are uh, struggle with is safety, personal safety, safety of their family. Those are the three issues. Um, are, those, are those issues that you struggle with? Do you get anxious about your health? Do you get anxious about money, about finances, about career, about job, about paying the bills? Do you get anxious about safety or the safety of your kids maybe um, and providing for them, taking care of them? Anxiety sometimes is just a part of life. Some things happen in life and you have to address it. It can be stressful and anxious. Um, But oftentimes, as we see in these statistics, anxiety in America is a continual challenge for many people, a constant challenge, a struggle. It's a persistent issue that doesn't go away for a lot of people. Um, In one article I read, uh, the, the, the writer who was commenting on the, the stress, anxiety over finances and health and personal safety, he said, he said that many of these fears are often tied to one another, finances, health, safety. They're tied to one another because of today's 24-7 news cycle and the near constant digital and social connectivity that frames modern life. Think about that. Meaning, what he's saying is, in other words, we have so many things on our phone or on our tablet or on our TV that can be put in front of us that it can give us reason to be anxious when we shouldn't have been anxious, reason to be stressed, reason to be panicked when we shouldn't have been, but it's there. And now we know about a crisis in Southeast Asia that we didn't know about or a crisis in South America that we didn't know about or a crisis in another part of the country that normally we wouldn't have known about and been stressed about, but now we do. Um, And so anxiety for many folks is a constant problem. And if you struggle with that, where where do you in in life, where do you find peace in the midst of that? Where do you find rest in the midst of the constant opportunity to be stressed or anxious? Where do you find silence or solitude in the midst of some of that chaos and noise? Where do you find calmness? That's the word we'll see here in Psalm 131. Where do you find that in the midst of that? Um, 
Well, Psalm 131, a short psalm, directs us, it directs you to the source of peace rather than anxiety. It, it directs you to a life of rest, a life of calmness rather than stress and anxiety. And if we look here at the beginning, David begins with several parallel statements about his perspective, the perspective that he is claiming or that he's taking on. He says three things that are parallel. He says, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high, and then finally, I'm not concerned about things that are beyond me, things that are too marvelous. So heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high, and then I'm not concerned about things that are just too much for me. So let's look at that. He says, my heart is not lifted up. That's a very straightforward way of saying pride. I am not going to be proud. I'm not going to be arrogant. I'm not going to have a high opinion of myself. I'm not going to have a high opinion of my ability, my gifts, my appearance, my wealth, whatever it could be that you take pride in or are tempted to take pride in. David says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to reject that. David will not be consumed with arrogance. That's the first thing. He's not going to, he's not going to do that, even though he had opportunity to. The second thing here, he says, my eyes are not raised too high. My eyes are not raised too high, which has a similar meaning, but it's a different connotation. It's similar to pride, but it's really the idea of not looking down on others. And you might call that contempt. You might call that condescension. He's not going to be condescending. He's not going to be contemptuous and look down on others, which is an impressive statement for David to make. Um, And we don't know when he wrote this. He He could have written this earlier in life, later in life, somewhere in between. But he had, a, he had a pretty impressive resume. Think about King David, and we'll just think for a moment. Um, he killed the warrior of Gath, Goliath, I mean the Terminator, basically. He killed him. He becomes Saul's right-hand man. He becomes the warrior of Israel. He becomes the king of Israel, the conquering king. He has, and we could go into that at length. It's a pretty strong resume. If, if you put your resume or my resume next to David's, Ours doesn't look that impressive. David has a strong CV, a strong resume. But he says here, I'm not going to look down on people. I'm not going to be condescending. I'm not going to be arrogant. He rejects that opportunity to be contemptuous. Even though he had all these accomplishments, he's not going to use that to be arrogant or condescending. And then the third thing he says here, he says, he will not be concerned about things that are too great or too marvelous for him. So he has he has set limits on his ambition or limits on his ability to understand. One writer says this could also mean he's not trying to take credit for things that God has done. He's not trying to figure out everything that God has done and is doing. He's set limits. There's a great quote from Calvin's Institutes where he says, Where God stops teaching, we should stop trying to be wise. It's a great quote. Where God stops teaching in Scripture, we should stop trying to be wise. Meaning there are some things that belong to God, and we we set our limits. We study God's Word. As Presbyterians, we better study God's Word. That's our heritage, to know the Bible, to study it. But even in the midst of studying it, we have to set limits and say some things belong to God. And we just will not know. And that's hard. I understand that. That is hard. But David says here he has set limits on himself. Limited what he's going to understand. Uh, as I was thinking about that, the, the obvious phrase came to mind of, from 1973, Clint Eastwood, you know, Dirty Harry. A man has got to know his limitations. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Mark's watched that. Thank you. It's a great, great line. A man has to know his limitations, and David has set limits on himself. Set limits. So in these first few statements, David has stated his intentions about what he will not do. I will not be proud. He says, I will not be condescending. I will not presume to understand everything that God has done. So he's put it in the the negative form. If we look at verse 2, it's the opposite side of the coin, and he says it in a positive form of what he actually will do. Verse 2, he says, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Calmed and quieted my soul. So here... Calm is the idea of something, the imagery here in the Hebrew is of something that is smooth. And so you, maybe an image would be if you're in the mountains and you woke up one morning uh, before the sun and you went out and there's a mountain lake there and there's just nothing happening. There's no ripples in the lake. There's nothing happening. It's just quiet and a smooth lake. That's the imagery of calm. Nothing is happening. It's completely flat. 
David saying, that's, that's my heart, that's my soul, resting in the Lord. It's calm, it's, it's quiet. And it's a great description of David's soul in the midst of whatever he was experiencing. We don't know when this was written. And we, and we have to go a step further and say, David was blessed also to not have to live with phones and tablets. He was incredibly blessed to not have to deal with Twitter. Um, the distractions of life on social media, the constant noise, the distractions. He didn't have to deal with that, which is great. Uh, we have to set limits on what we do, because otherwise it can be constant noise and distractions, um, a lack of peace. Do you feel that way sometimes? Do you feel there's constant noise, constant distractions? Do you feel that it's difficult to find peace in our culture, in our community? Do you feel like it's difficult to find calmness or silence in our culture, in our community. I feel that way a lot, I'm often. And I'm, I'm sure many of you do as well. But David here, he says, my soul, my heart is calm, it's quiet, it's resting in the Lord. It's a, it's a humble contentment, trusting in God. And the imagery he uses here is like a young child resting in the arms of his mother. It's not an infant who needs something from mom, who needs food, who needs to nurse. It's not a loud, hungry infant. That's not the imagery. What he's saying is this is, in Hebrew culture, probably a three-year-old child who is tired and comes to their, their mom and rests with their mom, not needing anything, but just finding rest, finding peace, finding silence. What's remarkable is that's how David is describing his relationship with God. David knows God in that sense. He is resting with God like a young child with a parent. Do you feel or do you think that that describes your relationship with God? That you can just rest in Him like a young child, like a three-year-old, resting with their parent? Do you sense that that's your relationship with God? Or is, it, is your relationship with God more the idea of, if I do things, then God will help me? A performance-based relationship. If I do this, if I'm nice to people, if I show up at church... Even on a Sunday in July when a lot of people are traveling, God will take notice. Or if I'm, if I'm nice to people on Monday at work, God will take notice. Is that how you interact with God? Or maybe do you see God as someone who's just waiting for you to commit that one sin and then He's going to just smite you? Do you see that as a God who's angry, who just wants to inflict pain? And oftentimes that's how we see Christianity. We see Christianity as morality or as I just have to do these things and then God will... He'll be okay with me. He'll leave me alone. And Christianity can be for, for perfect people. And we can be tempted to think that way. But David gives us a corrective on that. David says you don't have to have that perspective on God. You can see God as a parent that you can trust, that you can rest in, that you can find peace in. The imagery here of God as a parent, which is, you find that throughout the Old Testament. You see it in Hosea chapter 11 where God describes his relationship with Israel, with his people. He says in Hosea 11, God taught His people to walk, like teaching a child to walk. He took them up by their arms and healed them. God says, I bent down and fed them like a little child, Hosea 11. Or if you read through the, the book of Deuteronomy, at the end of, of Moses' life, um, he has led, <laughs> dealt with these people for decades. And in Deuteronomy, as, as Moses is preparing the people for his departure, for Joshua to take the lead, Moses says, in Deuteronomy, it was the Lord your God who went before you to fight for you as he did in Egypt. And in the wilderness you saw how the Lord carried you as a man carries his son until you came to this place when they're about to enter the promised land. The Lord carried you like a father would carry a son. It's the same imagery of a parent with a young child. And David is saying God is one you can trust and rest in. That God was good enough for David to rest in. Or in Deuteronomy, God was good enough for Moses and the Israelites, even though if you're studying through Exodus on Sunday nights with us, you realize that they often didn't trust in God. They often didn't follow God. But here we're reminded that God is enough for you. And David finds calmness. He finds peace. He finds rest in the Lord by coming to the Lord. Which if we were to take that into the New Testament, it takes us to Matthew chapter 11, where the Lord Jesus Christ says this. He says, All things... All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Then Christ says this, the words that you probably know. He says, Because of that, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Come to me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Matthew 11. What Christ is saying there is, is remarkable. He's saying, not some things, but all things are given to him by the Father. Every single thing. All things, which means your life is given to him. Your problems are given to him. Your pain is given to him. Your anxiety over health is given to him. Your anxiety over finances or over the safety of your family is given to him. He has all things, he says. And because I have all things, come to me and find rest. It's good to note what Christ doesn't say. He says, don't come to me to find the solution or find the answer to the problem. We don't come to God for solutions to problems. We don't come to God for spiritual life hacks. We don't come to God for a three-step plan to get out of the problem that we've created for ourselves. That's, that's not how we come to God. We come to God not for the solution or the three steps, but we come to God to get Him, to find Him, to rest in Him, to trust in Him, to know Him and to find rest for our souls. That's what David is saying here in Psalm 131. Find rest. Come to Him to find a calm soul, to find a quiet soul. Come to the Lord and find that. As we come to the end of the psalm, and this is a short one, notice how David finishes the psalm. He says, People of God, people of Israel, the church, you, this morning, hope in the Lord. He says, Hope in the Lord now. Sunday morning on a warm, hot, humid Sunday in July in Mount Pleasant. Hope in the Lord today. And then hope in the Lord tomorrow, Monday, and then Tuesday, next week, next year. He says, forevermore, continue to hope in Him until He returns. Continue to hope in Him until your faith, as the New Testament says, becomes sight. Put your hope and your confidence in Him. Which is, if you were here last week, it's very similar to the way Psalm 130 ended. Very similar. It concluded with an invitation to hope in God. Put your hope in God. Meaning, don't put your hope in stuff. Don't put your hope in material possessions, which is a temptation. Don't put your hope in somebody else. And that can take many different forms. That can be a celebrity. That can be an athlete. That can be a politician. That can be a social media influencer. That can be a cultural guru or idol or icon. Those are things that we're tempted to do in our culture. David here says, don't do any of that. Don't do any of that. Put your hope in the Lord. Put your hope in the triune God. Nothing else. And no one else. Put your hope in God. And we need that reminder. We have a lot of reminders in Scripture because we are quick to forget. I am quick to forget. You are quick to forget. And we need those reminders to trust in the Lord because there's always temptations to trust in someone else or something else. So this psalm, Psalm 131, seems very simple enough. Um, It's three verses. It's a short one. And it's a very simple message. It says, don't be proud. Don't be condescending. Don't try to figure everything out that God is doing, but find a calm soul in the presence of God. Find a quiet soul in the presence of God and put your hope in Him. Put your trust in Him. Put your confidence in Him. Very simple message. And so the question this morning is, so why don't we do that? Or to make it more direct, why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? I thought about that a lot this week. And there's probably many reasons. I think the... the, the primary one or a common one would be pride that we have too much confidence in our own ability and so we rely on ourself. We have too much confidence in our own ability and not enough confidence in the goodness of God. Not enough confidence in the sovereignty and the power of the triune God. A lot of confidence in ourselves. We can figure things out. We're smart people. College degree, a lot of you have secondary degrees. We we do well. We're successful, we work hard, we have a lot of confidence in ourselves and maybe not as much confidence in God. And if that's the reason that you don't follow Psalm 131, then the solution is very simple. The answer is very simple. You need to repent. You need to turn from that. You need to say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm trusting in myself more than you. Repentance is a turning of your direction of your life from sin or from an idol and turning to God in faith. Trusting in Jesus Christ, trusting in the one who is tortured and beaten and crucified for your sins and rose again on the third day. Trust in Him more than you trust in yourself. You will let yourself down. God will not let you down. 
you will have, as you know, you're going to have questions, you're going to have doubts, you'll, things will happen in your life, as you know, that you will not understand. But God is good. He promises that. And the record of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation shows us He is good. We don't always get answers. Job never got an answer, but we know He's good. And we know He's powerful. We know He's sovereign. So I think that's one reason we, we may not follow the, the text here and put our hope and confidence in God. I think there's another reason. I think there's another reason. Perhaps, and, and this is a tendency that I have sometimes, and maybe you have this as well with reading Scripture, because this is an old document. The Bible is an old document. Perhaps you read Psalm 131 and you have an idea that something related to this, something similar to this, that basically says, you know, this, this may have worked 3,000 years ago for David when this was written. But life is a lot different now in 2019 than it was in the ancient Near East. The pace of life in 2019 in Mount Pleasant and Charleston in America is much faster. The technology that we have, it's, it's a different world. The issues we face are different. There's a lot more going on. There's a lot more things in the world going on that we know about. The population is greater. The pace of life is faster. And so things are a little bit more difficult than this, David. Which is another way of saying that maybe this is too simplistic. This might have worked in ancient Near East, but not today, because we're so advanced after the Enlightenment. We're so confident in our own ability. And life is just different now. That might be, you might have an attitude, consciously or subconsciously, that when you read the text, you might think that. If that is something you're thinking about or wrestle with, I want you to just stop for a second and think about David's life. Think about David's life for a minute. David, who wrote this psalm. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that David dealt with more stress than any of you in this room, myself included. I want to go out on a limb and say that David dealt with more anxiety than anyone else in this room. And I just want you to think for a minute. Think about this. Most of you, if you have a teenage job, me, my job was cutting grass. Some of you probably cut grass, you work at Chick-fil-A, work at a restaurant as a teenager. What was David's job as a teenager? It was having a couple rocks and a piece of leather and fighting off bears, lions, predators from sheep. He wasn't working at Chick-fil-A. He wasn't on a lawnmower cutting grass. That was his teenage job. Let's, let's keep thinking about his life. Think about him as a teenager going before King Saul. That's probably a little stressful, a little anxiety. If you've ever been around someone important, I mean, this was their king. This would be like our president. It brings about some anxiety, some stress, especially for someone who's young. Then as a teenager, as a young man, he goes before Goliath, this one-man army, this warrior, this terminator. And, and David doesn't have any military-grade weapon, does he? Again, he has the leather strap and some rocks, which he was good at, obviously. But he didn't have all the equipment that Goliath had. That's probably some stress, probably some anxiety at some point. And he kills him. He chops his head off. You remember the story. Think about David's life a little bit more. After that, he begins to fight the Philistines for Saul. And he kills many Philistines, hundreds of Philistines. And that forces him on the run in caves. That produces stress. That produces anxiety. I mean, he killed hundreds of Philistines. If we get more to the point, not only did he kill them, he humiliated them. If you read, he also went and circumcised a few hundred of them and brought it back, brought the fruit of that back to Saul. That makes you enemy number one for the Philistines who always loved a good war. If you read the Old Testament, they love going to war. They're always fighting. David is enemy number one because of what he did and what he continued to do. That puts stress on you when you're running for your life. That puts anxiety when you're running for your life. Number one enemy in the region. And then you go, go a step further with David. Then he begins to play music for the king, right? And it's not just him hanging out in a, in a French parlor playing music. It's him hanging out with a mentally unhealthy king who decides, I think I want to kill this guy. You remember that, right? We studied that, I think, last year in 1 Samuel. And he doesn't try to kill David with putting something in his water, something in his wine. He says, oh, I've got this spear here. I can pin him to the wall. And he tries to kill him twice. That produces anxiety and stress in an individual. I think he had that. And then he's fleeing for... We don't know exactly how long, but he's fleeing from Saul, from the king of Israel, for an extended period of time, living in rocks, under rocks and caves in the wilderness and the desert. At one point, he has to actually go to the Philistines, if you remember this when we studied it. He has to go to them because it's safer to be with the enemy than to be with his own king. And he actually pretends that he's lost his mind, if you remember that. He's drooling all over himself. He's ranting and raving. I think he was under some stress. 
I think he was under some anxiety. And we haven't even gotten to the good stuff in his life, the exciting stuff in his life, the stuff that you make movies about. You know the rest of the story of David. I mean, from there, David goes on to hit all the big sins. Adultery, takes another man's wife. He's guilty of murder, the murder of her husband. Then he covers it up. He tries to act like it's not him. So he's pretty much smashing the whole Ten Commandments, covering it up. And he has to deal with the guilt of that, the anxiety of that, because he's confronted by the prophet of God, Nathan, who says, you're the man, David. You're the one who's done all this stuff. And he deals with the guilt of that. That produces stress and anxiety. And then his life, the rest of the story, as you know, goes, he lost their infant child as a result of that uh, affair with Bathsheba. He lost that child. Um, And he went through stress and anxiety because of that. He dealt with a lot. If you remember the very end of David's career, there was one last situation. He almost lost his kingdom because his son Absalom said, I pretty much hate my dad and I want the kingdom and I want all my dad's wives. And he went after his dad and David was forced to flee. That produces stress, anxiety for someone. And then he loses, almost loses his kingdom. He does lose his son, Absalom. That produces stress, anxiety on David. He dealt with a lot more stress than most of us, all of us, will deal with if you look at his entire life. We do, I don't say that to minimize anyone's pain or anyone's issues, but he dealt with a lot. He had a lot of anxiety, but he knew in the midst of that, he knew that he could find a quiet, calm soul if he was resting in God. If he would put his hope in the triune God, he knew that God would be gracious to him in the midst of all those things I mentioned about his life. And that's all that we have in in Scripture. There's probably more that's not in there. He knew that God would be gracious to him. He knew that God made a covenant, a covenant with Abraham, a covenant to David. He knew that God made promises to him, promises to his people. And because of that, he knew God's character. And so this morning, it, it, it was good enough for David to just trust in God. It wasn't too simplistic. It's good enough for you if you know the character of God, if you know the promises of God in Scripture to His people, promises that He makes to you because of His plan of redemption, because He's seen you as a sinner and decided, I will redeem that sinner. I'm going to send my Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to take on human flesh, and He's going to live a perfect life. He's going to be the second Adam and and fulfill the law. And then he's going to give up his life on a cross for sinners like you to atone for your sin. And those those promises find their fulfillment at the cross where he dies on the cross where where he's beaten, he's nailed to a wooden beam and crucified for your sins. And that demonstrates that God will forgive your sins, that he will deal with the problems of your life. He will take away God's wrath on sin. He will take away your guilt. And instead he gives you God's peace. Romans chapter 5, the peace of God that we have. He gives you that when you trust in Him. The Holy Spirit gives you that when you trust in Him, when you repent of your sin and and follow Him and and find rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are His promises to you. Those are the promises of grace. That's God's covenant with you. And it's signified in the Lord's Supper. It's sealed. Those promises are sealed upon you through the bread, through the juice. And so this morning as I pray, prepare yourself. Think about those promises that God makes to you. Pray to prepare yourself as we receive the bread and the juice this morning. Let's pray.